Zoom or if you're watching online uh, on YouTube or even later. So let me welcome you very, very warmly. You might have been here yesterday for our first part of the association journey, which was shared by our president, Aluska Ritchie. I have the honor of being your chair today, and my name is Viola Lewis. I'm an executive board member, and my portfolio on the board is training. So we have four of those association journeys, and each of the journeys will be shared by another Expo colleague. So yesterday, we already had a wonderful journey, and we heard of the challenges and of the opportunities of our colleagues throughout the world. Yesterday, we went to Malaysia, we went to Hungary, Slovenia, Italy, and Turkey. And today, we've got an equally interesting lineup of our colleagues of our tourist guide associations. So today, we will be going again to Hungary, then to Ireland, to Israel, to Peru, to Switzerland, and to London. And we also have some of our trainers who will share their journey briefly with us. So that leaves me um, or gives me the opportunity to introduce our first speaker. And our first speaker is Eva Sita, the vice chairperson of the Federation of Hungarian Tourist Guides. So we are going back to Budapest and Hungary. Enjoy our association's journey. No, I can't, I can't hear again. Hello, Eva. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now I hear, until now I couldn't hear anything. Okay. Sorry about that. So, uh, would you like to share your screen? Yes. Yes. I share my screen, and uh, <clears throat> where do I have? There's um, a green button at the bottom of your yes, screen. Yes. 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 I, I know, but uh, now, uh -huh. okay. Uh, yes, ju just a minute, just a minute. Um, it disappeared. What Shall I we our second speaker, and then you have more time to look for your presentation. Um, again, I have, I have it here. Yes. Now. Okay. Uh, can can you see it? No, or see it yet? You can't see it yet. No. Uh, okay. Uh, yes. And now, now. No. Okay. I can't see here it. I here I have it. And share now. It's okay. Good. Yeah, yes. Good. And if you want to go to slideshow. Yes, yes. Um, well done. Sure. Yes. That's it. Yep, that should be it. Click. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, so can I start? Can I? 
Okay, we can't see the slideshow, but if you uh, change your slides manually, then that. that yes, should... yes, I, I, I will do it manually. Yes, of course. Okay, so. so can... uh, okay, finally, <laughs> finally, I will uh, start. And uh, <clears throat> I think uh, I, I am very happy uh, that I can be with you. Uh, and uh, greetings, nice greetings, uh, heartily welcome from Hungary, from Budapest, from our beautiful country and our beautiful city. And uh, I think uh, it is uh, uh, it is the time uh, to introduce uh, our country for all of you who are living in in the uh, whole uh, in the whole world. So uh, our country can be found here in the very heart of Europe, in Central Europe. Uh, it can be also say, uh, said that it is the Carpathian Basin. Uh, all around of our country, there are high mountains, like the Carpath in the Romania and Ukraine, and the Tatra Mountains in Slovakia, and uh, the Alps in Austria, and the Dinarit in the south, in the Balkanic countries in Serbia and Croatia. Uh, the territory is uh, 93,000 square kilometers. The population lies at 9.71 million as for the census of 2021. Uh, we have many rivers. The main river is the River Danube, which is the largest and longest river in Europe uh, with 2,800 uh, kilometers. And uh, uh, it is flowing uh, through 10 countries. Uh, so we have as being in a in a basin that means that the, the most part of our country is plain. So we have the great Hungarian plain. You can see it on the picture. Uh, we have also a lot of horses riding all around. We have uh, uh, also nice rivers uh, uh, with a lot of of animals and and um, uh, birds, for example. For example, we have here the, the largest national park. We have in Hungary 10 national parks. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, we can't see your slides. We are still on your title slide. If you um, they want us to see the nice horses you are talking about and the landscapes. Really? Oh. Yeah, if you move on to... Oh, my God. Yeah, we are still on slide one. Oh, no, no, no. no. Huh. You just click through the slides on the left hand side. There should be a small picture of the slides, and then we will see the one you click on. Um, Can you see now? I'm still seeing the first slide, hmm. the opening slide. Uh -huh. Slide control. Record, record, record. Ah. I, I, I can't understand this. Okay, in this case, let's, let's just listen to your presentation and... Uh, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah. I want it, I want it. Yeah. Perhaps you can put there some icon uh, next to the percent below of the PowerPoint. You push this. Uh, look at this. No. Okay. Of mm -hmm. And how about now? Can you see it now? Can you see now? No, we just see the the PowerPoint desktop. Hmm. Do we have it on full screen? Yes, I I, uh, I put it uh, for before that on full screen. Now it is not on full screen. Slide control and share. Uh, 
If you ever, may I suggest just continue without the slides? It is very interesting to listen to you. So let's um, keep technology. Yeah, and okay. No. Uh, or, or maybe, no. Is it not possible that just now I will send it to you? Uh, Perim, uh, it is maybe it is too big because there are lots of photos. Let's use oh, the last remaining okay. minutes oh, yeah. and just share your journey without without the without the slides. Uh, yes. Okay. So, <clears throat> so we have here in Hungary uh, the Great Hungarian Plain, uh, where we can find the, the largest national park uh, with uh, lots of animals and and very interesting plants. Uh, with rivers, for example, and uh, agriculture and industry is carried out here. Um, and maybe you have heard, some of you might have heard about the goulash soup and the perker, which is originating here. This is the most typical Hungarian food, which you can also uh, taste in the restaurants in, in, in Hungary, in Budapest also. Um, we have also here on the Great Hungarian Plain also several spas with the medical water. Uh, some of them are uh, at around 50, 60 degrees. And uh, we have also <clears throat> very nice villages and great cities as well now. And uh, <clears throat> the other geographical area in Hungary is a hilly area, which is called the Transdanubium. Uh, it is to the... Uh, to the west from the river Danube. So this is the western part of Hungary, which is hilly. And uh, <clears throat> uh, it used to be at the Roman age, the province Pannonia. So therefore, still today, we have there in the western part of Hungary in Transanubium, uh, um, and uh, a very big uh, Roman heritage as well. We have uh, uh, ancient castles, ruins, of course, some carved stones, cemeteries, etc., from the Roman age. Um, in the middle of this uh, beautiful landscape of uh, Transalubium, we have the Lake Balaton. It's the largest lake of Central Europe. I am really sorry, and I can't believe that you can you can see uh, my slides. How about this one? Can you see now? Can you see my slide? Can you see my slide? Uh, dear uh, Eva, I'm I've joined you on stage again. Um, no, we can we can't see your slide. Can't see the introduction. So may okay. I suggest for the last two remaining minutes, tell us a little bit more about your association. Okay. It's really nice to hear about the beautiful country of yeah. Hungary. But okay, 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 okay. So uh, our association is 33 years old. So it was founded in uh, uh, 1990. And we have uh, now around 200 members. Um, and we, uh, our task is to represent the professional and economic interest of the tourist guides in Hungary uh, to strive to enhance the professional level of tourist guiding to eliminate illegal tourist guiding uh, activities based on law uh, and to step up uh, uh, financial and social reward of tourist guides as well. Uh, and so we need to pay attention to relevant rules and regulations and submitting proposals to amend them. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> So uh, we have a, a regulation which is saying that, uh, which is providing that uh, um, only those uh, persons are uh, allowed to carry on tourist guide activities who are uh, professionals, so uh, who has the, the license. So after uh, fulfilling the uh, successful um, uh, examination. Uh, uh, after that, uh, one can have one can receive this uh, uh, this uh, uh, card. Okay, and uh, uh, so it is. Pro uh, it is the provision is that uh, only those people can uh, carry on the um, tourist guide activities who has this 
certain this uh, special card. But unfortunately, this regulation is not implemented in practice because it is uh, not uh, uh, not uh, uh, there is no provision who which, which uh, uh, authority should make uh, or carry on the on-site control. So there is no on-site control or at least very limited. For example, we were striving to uh, start uh, such controls. We formulated a letter that uh, based on our uh, regulations, um, uh, those who have not this special um, a card of, uh, of the licensed tourist guides are uh, doing illegal tourist guiding activities and uh, they are, uh, because of them, uh, unfortunately, uh, many of our colleagues uh, have not enough work. So they, they live without work, unfortunately. So we, uh, um, we uh, uh, prepared a package of, uh, of uh, uh, proposals for amendment of uh, these regulations, and uh, we submitted it uh, to the uh, tourist, uh, tourism National Tourism Agency, uh, which is a governmental uh, organization, and they, uh, of course, uh, accepted and they accepted that. But unfortunately, it doesn't move forward. So we made lots and lots of efforts. Um, we we contacted also the parliamentary commission on tourism, the municipality, uh, the chamber of commerce, um, and we got only promises from the municipality. We got rejection that this is not their job to to deal with the the tourist guides. So lots and lots of efforts and uh, letters overhanding uh, to illegal tourist guides. Etc. And we made uh, 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 a text, uh, and so we uh, we made a report about uh, this uh, <clears throat> this uh, uh, this control which we carried out, uh, and and still and still nothing moved forward. So yeah, we still yeah. we are yeah. still working. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, I can see it has been a challenging year for very, you know. cha very challenging year. Yes, that's right, really right, and and it is uh, sometimes very hopeless. So that means uh, every day uh, groups are coming to visit Budapest, especially from Asian countries, from Asia, India, for example, Malaysia, uh, Thailand, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and uh, they don't they don't book any tourist guide here in Budapest. Uh, their own, um, uh, their, so own their own tour managers who are guiding. Yeah, and, tour manager uh, and, and mm -hmm, yes, yeah. uh, are, are making It's true, isn't it, isn't it, that uh, a lot of uh, visitors don't know that we tourist guides have an area-specific qualification and we are really interpreting the heritage of, um, of our country. So you have really demonstrated that our work uh, goes on and we wish you all the very best in the future for this and of course being a member of the forum of uh, the global a global forum for a tourist guides our voice or the voice of one association is much stronger uh, together yeah so thank you Eva, for your uh, presentation i'm afraid time is up okay. um, and again thank you for persevering with technology but but maybe I can send send my presentation to you and you can put it on the website of or on the YouTube that, yeah. channel. Okay, thank you, you so much. Me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, so the next speaker, our next colleague, will be Jesse McDonald of the Approved Tourist Guides of Ireland. So Jesse, coming from the the, the west western side of Europe. Please join me on stage, Jesse, and tell us about your Tourist Guide Association and about especially the journey this year, the challenges and the opportunities you faced and the projects you're carrying out. So looking forward to listening to you. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for this opportunity to share 
the success stories and the challenges of the past year. My name is Jesse MacDonald and I am a member of ATKI, the Approved Tourist Guides of Ireland. So I hope everybody can see my screen and hear me, yes? Hopefully that's the case. Can you hear me, uh, Viola? Hello, Jesse. Yeah, I just came back on stage um, and we can hear you loud and clear. Wonderful. We can see your screen as well, but it's not in um, slideshow mode. I don't know if you could go to slideshow mode. Certainly. There we go. Fantastic. That's it. Okay. So I'll start with a good news story. It's been a very positive year for tourist guides with the return time of overseas visitors. And according to the Irish Tourism Industry Confederation, which is ITIC, they say that 63% uh, of tourist guides have reported an increase in visitors and 56% of guides attribute that success to their own marketing initiatives. And I suppose that just underlines the point that it is crucial that we as tourist guides are capable of doing our own marketing. Uh, to quote ITIC, demand from overseas and domestic markets is reported as having made a resilient recovery in 2023. And their forecast for is for renewed growth in international travel. The forecasts are positive despite the current geopolitical situation. So uh, continue with their forecast is that we'll be back to pre-pandemic levels by 2026. And they highlight the fact that in current investment is in two main areas, that of regional development and that of extending the visitor season. And a lot of money is being thrown at that by uh, Irish authorities, 68 million euro for developing tourism in the Midlands and 37 million uh, to extend the season. So that's uh, an opportunity for ATGI members with the growing demand for tourist guides, both in the English language and increasingly in other languages. Now, the other good news story is that membership is up. And when I say up, I mean really up. It has doubled in three years and it has increased by over 100 members in just one year last year. So this is a double edged sword. It creates a challenge. How do we cope physically with the increased workload? So the solution we came up with in Atke is to streamline the application process. There's now an online application form only. You cannot have a hard copy. And the membership secretary receives uh, an email with new applicant in the subject line. The applicants themselves have to create a profile for themselves where they fill in the relevant details and they have to upload the relevant documentation. So that means that unless they have ticked all the boxes, it doesn't go through to the membership secretary. And once the membership secretary receives that email, he simply, he or she simply uh, verifies that everything that is required is there and asks the board for approval. So it has really helped in the automation of the membership application process. And even renewals are now only done online. You have to pay online and no longer with checks or, or, or with cash. Uh, we've also increased the paid hours for our one employee to deal with that extra workload. Sorry. There we go. Uh, the increased workload and the extended season means that it is increasingly difficult for board members to get together physically or even on Zoom to, to meet each other and have board meetings. But we did succeed in having two in-person meetings this year and seven virtual meetings and 12 subcommittee meetings. So increasingly, we have to use a Zoom platform uh, we had a hybrid AGM, which allowed many members who would not otherwise have been able to attend the AGM to attend. And we're also setting up uh, what we call streams. So I'll explain that in more detail here. Um, streams would be subcommittees made up of members with at least one director on each subcommittee. So we have various categories. For example, next year, uh, immediately next week, even we're just uh, we have just finished our AGM. Uh, we will have a subcommittee for driver guides. And that is a category where, to my surprise, I discovered we had over 70 members who are driver guides. And they have very specific legislation. And sometimes they have difficulty interpreting the legislation. So we have asked for a meeting with the transport, the National Transport Authority's head officer for compliance in order to get straight answers to our questions. 
so that's in the process, uh, that's in the pipeline. Also, there was a demand at the AGM for the recognition of badges from Northern Ireland, which is part of the UK. And there was a request from one member that we would allow people from Northern Ireland who had done their training from either of the two institutes there to be allowed to join our association. So that's a big topic. It created a lot of interest. And again, there's going to be a subcommittee for that or a stream. We've known for years we need to be more present on the digital, um, the various platforms, social media platforms. We just haven't had the manpower. The solution, we hope, is to get expert advice from people expert in that field and then follow their plan with a subcommittee, with volunteers, with members who are not on the board. Trade liaison and training and standards, that subcommittee, those subcommittees have already been up and running and doing a lot of good work this year. And of course, we will need, uh, we already have uh, a subcommittee for the WFTGA bid to host the 2026 convention. If we are successful at the end of January, we will need a lot more volunteers to cope with the extra workload. Now, we've also gone ahead with our usual business. We have had a FAM trip, a two-day FAM trip to Northern Ireland this year, and that is in response to a request at the AGM last year, excuse me, uh, with the collaboration of our counterparts in Northern Ireland, NITCA, we organised a tour of Belfast and Derry, stroke London Derry, and we also had regional tours, day tours to three counties in Ireland, Cork, Wicklow and uh, Kilkenny. Uh, we've continued with online talks, but we've decided to concentrate on experts in their field. So we've had recently, for example, an expert in geology, and we've had three fantastic webinars from them. So going forward, we're tending to ask experts in their field. And we just had a very successful hybrid AGM outside of Dublin, outside of the capital, in, in order to respond to the demand from members. It's more cost effective to have it outside the capital. And it is also uh, more convenient for people to be able to attend, even if they live in remote areas. So there is an extra cost to that. It costs about €5,000 extra to have a hybrid event where people can attend it virtually. But we feel it's worth it. Uh, because it makes for, for a more democratic uh, association. Now, the main uh, one of the main areas we have uh, looked into this year area uh, this year was to put in a bid to host the 2026 WFTGA convention in Cork, my native uh, city in Ireland. And in order to do that, uh, we had to do a feasibility study. And at the beginning, I was very reticent to take on something so big. But as I delved into it, I discovered that it would help us achieve our aim. Something, again, that came from the floor at the last AGM. And that was to raise the profile of our association uh, amongst the tourism stakeholders. So already, and now we know that we are one of the four finalists um, and we will be present in Sicily going forward, uh, already we have achieved those aims in raising the profile. We have worked in collaboration with a professional conference organizer, CPI. We've worked in collaboration with various tourism stakeholders like the Tourism Board of Ireland, like the Cork Convention Bureau, the Lord Mayor, the municipality and so on. So we're absolutely thrilled. Although it has been a lot of hard work and there were many, many hoops to jump through, some would say too many, uh, we, we have achieved already those aims. And we're just looking forward to, the, the, um, to meeting you all in person in Sicily, hopefully in a few weeks' time. So it only remains for me to say, Gigi Ling, uh, do join us there, uh, either in, in person or, or virtually. We're very much looking forward to attending in person a WFTGA convention. And I would say to other member associations of the WFTGA, it's a fantastic process to go through. You learn a lot from it and it creates a common bond also amongst your members and a common uh, objective and hopefully helps in that uh, bonding of, of the members. So thank you very much for your attention. And uh, if you have any questions, they're very welcome. Thank you very much, Jenny. Uh, Jesse, sorry, Jesse. <laughs> And uh, my goodness, 100 more members, what, what an achievement. But as you say, a double-edged sword. So well done for welcoming so many uh, members. 
And also thank you for reminding us of the uh, bid countries for the 2026 convention. What we actually do at the end of each of our journey sessions uh, we are having just now yesterday, we showed the video produced by our colleagues in Malaysia and over today and then over the next two sessions, there will be the videos um, professionally prepared by the other three bidders. So Cork will be coming up by tomorrow or the day after. Today we are very, we'll be going to the, to the Philippines for uh, the convention video. But thank you very much again, Jesse from Cork. And it gives me okay. great pleasure, gives me great pleasure now to welcome our next chairperson of the Tourist Guide Association member, and it's Yoni Shapira from Israel, from Israel's incoming Tourist Guide Association. I'm really delighted, Yoni, you could uh, join us today and um, looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Viola. And it's great being here and seeing all these colleagues from around the world. Uh, I'm in the webinar, but I cannot see, let's see if I could share the screen. Uh, by the way, the picture behind me is a model of Jerusalem that I was in charge of as curator in Times Square in 2017, Gulliver's Gate, if any of you get there and visit it. Um, I'm going to my share screen and can you see it? Yes, we can see it. Thank you very much, Yoni. Everything works well. Okay, so uh, we are heading on, and this is our report for 2023 for Moreshet Derech, name of our association, which means Heritage Trail. It's the incoming Tourist Guide Association of Israel. And basically, a few words about the country. I see it's not, now it is changing. Uh, it's a small country. Uh, it's in the middle of the Middle East. We have nine and a half million citizens. Uh, our peak tourism was in 2019, four and a half million tourists. And in our association, we represent 1,500 member tour guides out of uh, totally about three and a half thousand incoming tour guides and total registered in the Ministry of Tourism, about 7,000 tour guides, many of them also domestic who have only uh, one of two languages, or both languages, Hebrew and Arabic, the two official languages of the country. The country is known primarily because it's the Holy Land. Although it's very small, it, everybody wants to visit it. And be it Muslim, Christian, Jews, uh, places like Nazareth, Haifa, Tel Aviv, the number one gay destination in the world, Jerusalem, the central hub for the three monotheistic Abrahamic religions, and so on, and so forth. And among the association, uh, we have tour guides who are Jewish, who are Muslim, Christian, Druze, Bedouin, uh, Israelis, Palestinians, depends on how they define themselves. Or So we have uh, quite a variety of narratives, uh, but the story is the same story, the history that goes back from the days of Abraham, and before that, through Jesus, Muhammad, First Temple period, Second Temple period, all the way till today. Uh, this year was a great year, or started as a great year. Uh, following COVID, we went back to normal uh, in 2020, in March of 22, and we have reached uh, about uh, 70 to 75 percent of the 2019 uh, pandemic years. Uh, so we started doing our educational tours, assisting tour guides who were economically affected during COVID and needed some additional support with food rations and whatever we collected from donations during COVID. And we tried to uh, convince the Ministry of Tourism to change regulations involved us more in what's happening and do a national survey of tour guides to find out how many have left the industry and the profession in 2000 or during COVID years. And unfortunately, we still do not have a full picture of it. Uh, within our voluntary activity, we have volunteered to uh, assist with infrastructure and community issues that affect the tourism. So for instance, uh, redoing and retouching archeological digs 
or going to a web to a dig site that you could see here in the picture before and after creating a path that was all grown over during COVID uh, and volunteers cleared it out and a place for sit down and a place of exposing, exposing the archeology span to the visitor's eye, something that was obviously not accessible after COVID. So we are involved with that. Uh, we also were involved in meeting a lot of Christian clergy and providing several services together with them. Uh, one of them was escort. You could see here on the bottom left, the woman here in the yellow uh, jacket, she is a tour guide. We had such tour guides and sometimes police escorting convoys, or I would say not convoys, but uh, processions of Greek Orthodox of Armenian. Here it's a Catholic uh, patriarch uh, and bishops that are heading from their location in the old city of Jerusalem to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre for ceremonies. And sometimes they were abused, abused both by uh, Muslim youngsters, but also from Jewish Orthodox youngsters that have a problem with Christianity and so on. Uh, and we made sure to take pictures of them and follow up with a complaint to the police, helping the clergy with it, who were really not interested in going all the way to the police. We did it with them. So we met with uh, heads of the communities, heads of the Christian churches, and we also helped in on the left hand, on the right hand side, with reconstructing some of the older uh, 19th century cemeteries that were in disarray, uh, where some of the statue, some of the uh, graves were uh, smashed, and we helped cleaning them up and rebuilding them. So we were very active during this year, and it all changed in one day. And I have to take a deep breath because that one day, October 7th, exactly uh, two months ago, was the worst atrocities against the Jewish people that we have witnessed since the Holocaust. 1,300 civilians, women, children, men were massacred, murdered, raped, mutilated. 340 women, children, and elderly, including Holocaust survivors, were taken as refugees, as hostages, sorry, not refugees, hostages, to the city of Gaza, and a war literally broke out as a result of that because till then we had a so-called ceasefire uh, and we were used to living within a routine of ceasefire with barrages of rockets every now and then, but still it was peaceful and tourists came. Uh, during the Holocaust, we have to remember there was no Jewish sovereign state. And when Israel created as the only Jewish state in the world, never again, was an ethos that Israel was established on. We are not going to accept a massacre of Jews and a rampage of anti-Semitism, wherever it is, because Israel has a sovereign Jewish state and Jewish army. However, October 7th took place, and it did happen again. And this put us all into shock. The magnitude of the massacre was 15 times that of 9-11, if you look at the proportion to the population. So you can just think of how bad it is. Tourism went from 100 to zero in one day. Literally every group that was here, we had to shuffle out of the country and we put together with the Ministry of Tourism, a few volunteers, uh, both Palestinian Arab speakers from Bethlehem and other places to move them out to the airport and send them on the way. Uh, the hostages are still there. The war is raging for the last 60 days. And 250,000 civilians, Israelis, were evacuated from two areas in the country. One in the Galilee, where the Hezbollah joined the show with shelling northern uh, communities, northern kibbutzim cities, uh, and so on. And from the western Negev, and all were evacuated to the hotel. Unfortunately, the world is silent. And this is something that disturbs us very much, and we have to deal with it. Uh, where is the war raging from? So here we have a map of Israel uh, in the small yellow on the right-hand side, and the Gaza Strip that's now taken over by the Israeli army. We could not accept that kind of hostility. We are not at war with the Palestinians. We have called them for 
and still calling them to move to the southern part, uh, to the Rafah and the Egyptian border area for a safe haven where we will not shell and bomb. And we are going under after the infrastructure of a terrorist organization called Hamas. And they have over 500 miles of underground tunnels that they have taken the hostages to, and that's where the communications stock of pilage. Today, we found the biggest stockpile of arms under a school and in an infirmary. And we also have the north, the north, the Galilee, where all the kibbutzim, moshavim, from here and from around the Gaza Strip were all evacuated to hotels. And here on the left-hand side, you could see how long it takes you before you have to duck down into bomb shelters when barrages start. And every day we have four or five barrages, uh, including an hour ago that were towards Tel Aviv, a uh, major populated area in the center of the country. A million and a half people have to duck, lie on the ground, put their heads, hands overhead or run into a building. So this is something that is not acceptable to live by. So what we started, the minute the war started, we reinstated an unemployment committee uh, helping the tour guides to receive compensation. We had meetings with the heads of the social security and here in the middle picture, we could see uh, my deputy, we Lama Chinese uh, guide, licensed Israeli guide, who is Christian in her background, uh, speaks Hebrew, studies biblical studies and guides in uh, Cantonese and in English. And she's head of the unemployment committee going into the detailed way of how to get compensation, which we've still not received from COVID. Next to her is Gadi, also one of our uh, involved members in our executive board who is now called up to reserve duty and is serving in the army. So we had meetings with the government, we had meetings with uh, everybody. However, Ministry of Tourism has not met with us yet. And it's two, two months into the war. Uh, we were exposed to media, I was, and others were on media, on TV, on interviews, uh, and where fighting is going on. And here is where we decided we cannot sit at home and wait for help. We have to help the country that is in need. And right now with 250,000 evacuated people, leaving their homes, leaving everything behind, people started volunteering. Food, toys, goods, medication, uh, driving families around, families who lost everything. The homes were burned, the cars were burned. People who are grieving that lost their children or the sons, daughters, grandparents are still as hostages. So here you could see some of our vans, touring vans like uh, we learned that they have in Ireland. We have 550 of them, that each one has a van with higher standards and we need a special license and insurance to cover it. And we packed it with goods that are distributed from different places in the country to other places in the country. And it's all out of our pocket, our money, our paying the gas and our time, but it keeps us busy and we wanna help. So this is some of the things that we are doing. So we have several WhatsApp groups of needed to send things from here to there, from this to that, uh, taking soldiers who have a 20, uh, our break from coming out of Gaza to run from one side of the country to the other just to see their girlfriends, wives, children, and have a shower and go back to battle. So this is keeping us pretty busy. We established an emergency fund, and I'm right now in the process. One minute, and I'm finishing. Um, Viola, uh, emergency fund uh, to raise money. And how do we think of raising money? Every one of us as tour guides has made friends with our tourists, especially when you spend a week, 10 days, two weeks with a group, mostly on religious uh, faith-based tourism, Christian pilgrims, pastors, churches, communities, where they invite us to come to their countries and speak to their churches to bring them to Israel, or Jewish tourists that come on family visits, community synagogue tours. They're personal friends. So we can approach them to say, come on, guys, help us out. We need your help. In the meantime, tourism will not go back to normal. Why? Because all the hotels are being occupied by these Jewish refugees, the 250,000 that are taking public spaces for classrooms and kindergartens and psychological uh, assistance and 
kids are playing and drawing on walls and furniture and so on. After everything goes to normal, hotels will have to be revamped and rebuilt in order to go back to accept tourism. So once the market, once the war is over, and I hope for the benefit of the people of Gaza, the Palestinians, and for our sake, with the hostages, let the hostages come home, the war end, and we will start living a new life with a new reality. Uh, and doing this and spreading this, the or sharing this information with the WFTGA, you know, we were putting together a committee of how can we help Ukraine? Well, yeah. this is how you can help us. We need the WFTGA to take a stand, a public stand as a committee that represents guides all over the world. And we are uh, messengers of peace. We bring cultures together. We bring stories together. We bring narratives together. We are not pushing a conflict. We are creating a dialogue and therefore take a stand against terrorism, rape, which is totally unacceptable, genocide. When the calls for genocidal calls in Europe and in America of wipe out the Jews is happening in universities, massacres and anti-Semitism. Yeah. So this is something that for our Syracuse uh, conference, I would like to see that a letter would be put out to the UNWTO to take a stand against these atrocities that are unacceptable. Thank okay, you. Thank, very, very thank you much. very much, uh, Yoni, for coming um, to our session today and for sharing your um, your messages with us. And uh, our, all our television screens are full of the terrible news, you know, from different parts of the world. And as you say, we as tourist guides, we are peace ambassadors. Absolutely, we bring people together. We are a non-political organization, but we absolutely stand for peace everywhere in the world. And may I also congratulate you, um, Yoni, on all the volunteering you are doing and other tourist guides as well. So we are not only professional tourist guides, but we are human beings too. And we have a wonderful profession where we meet other fellow human beings. And as you say, we do stand up for, for peace wherever we can. So thank you. Yet again. And, thank um, you. Yeah, and um, give our best regards to your colleagues as well. May I now uh, invite the next speaker onto the stage? And we are going to a completely different part of the world. Now we are going to Peru. So Gerardo of us. GUIPA, the Association of Professional Tourist Guides of Arequipa, will be joining us. And I'm looking forward to hearing your news, uh, your news of um, the well, other side of the world from where I am. I'm in uh, Scotland, by the way. Our headquarters, the WFDG headquarters is in Vienna, but the executive board is kind of spread, located in different parts of the, the world. Okay, over to you, Gerardo. ¿Qué tal? Muy buenos días. Here in Peru, this is uh, half past 10, half past 10 in the morning. Bien, amigos, uh, my name is Gerardo Pinto. I'm president of uh, one of these uh, guiding associations we have in Peru, in Arequipa, of course. Uh, you know, just a little bit, Peru is uh, it's a quite large country in, in South America. We are about 30 million people which capital is uh, Lima, uh, where we are nearly 10 million people in Lima. And where I live, and I'm connected, is uh, Arequipa. In Arequipa, we are 1.5 million people. This is the second largest city of Peru. Bien amigos, uh, what about our challenges we, we, we have this, uh, this year? You know, if you were following some news about Peru, uh, December uh, 2022, a year ago, we had a political crisis, a political crisis which affects, uh, they were really bad for this uh, industry, tourism. Easily 30, 40% of these uh, bookings, they dropped. And of course, you know, our colleagues, tour guides, 
they uh, well they they didn't have a job for few months it's uh, normally the season start in march but uh, this one moved to june more or less to june and uh, well great part of us we have a family and very few a long pandemic very few of us a long pandemic we had a great idea to uh, found uh, a well some friends they might value of us so is in this way that um, the Peruvian government compromised to support with uh, some money only once but uh, this uh, promising it, it took a long time it was in January more or less of 2022 and we just got the benefit a few weeks ago no a few weeks ago it was uh, very sad and at the end not the amount of money that they promised well um, the other problem, a problem we have, is um, the law, the guiding law. It was modified, or oh, well, it was approved to be modified uh, middle of 2022. And we are still working in some articles, okay? Because, uh, you know, in Peru, we have to study about three years to get uh, a license to be a tour guide. So we have to study. It could be in a state university or it could be in a private uh, institution or a private university. So there is an investment. And of course, no, you have to study, give exams. At the end, the quality of uh, knowledge we, we, we manage is, uh, well, it's, it's pretty good. So we are professionals. You must be a professional to work as a tour guide. But this uh, law we had, it gave, or oh, they opened a window. No, oh, well, it, it was a door. <laughs> they opened a door that any person, any professional, right, they could do this job. So it was very controversial. We had to work quite a lot to convince authorities to stop that idea because in reality it was to pay some political favors on the way. But isn't this way that the Congress finally, you know, they reconsider and that's why, no, this law, it was modified. And as I said a few seconds ago, we are working in changing some of these articles to stop that intention. So they are the main uh, achievements, we uh, challenges we, 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 have, we have in Peru, no? Working laws, yes, and uh, well, the, the political situation in Peru is not as bad as in another parts of the world, but the consequences, they could be very bad if we don't have a solution this year. Muy bien. What about the shipments? Uh, as GIPA, as a member of the Federation, is uh, we are working constantly in prepare or yeah, intri uh, invite our members, not only members of my association, members of other associations of Arequipa, um, to be, well, to, to get some courses about archaeology, about uh, biology, uh, guidance techniques, to, to learn more about of some of these uh, important or icon places visited by tourists, international tourists, like Santa Catalina convent or museums that we have in the area, okay? So that's something that we are working 
uh, all the time, at least once a month, we prepare and we offer a course to the members of this association, and as I said, members of other other associations, all freelance tour guides. Yes. Um, we 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 were working as well. We had a lot of meetings with uh, authorities uh, to work about this. Uh, uh, economical support from the local government. It was quite long, tiring, exhausting. Uh, at the end, no, at the beginning, they promised quite something like uh, $1,000 per person. But uh, at the end, we only got $200 and less, and not all of us. No? Um, there is a situation here, no? As a tour guide, um, as an independent worker, uh, on the way, you don't have any benefit to get a free health service or a pension, okay? Uh, which is uh, something that other, other activities they have. The thing is that uh, we are working no, in this way. The economical benefits, because we pay taxes, Yes, and uh, we are working how to get these uh, uh, services like health service, which is so important, and to work and some laws to get a pension in the future. You know, tourism for us as a tour guide is our passion. We start working first as an experience and 20, 30 years later, you realize that you are still working no? in this business. And uh, 30 years working is true. No? Uh, you are well paid in some way. But uh, as any worker who pays taxes, we don't get any support from the, from the, from the main government or the state. Mm -hmm. So it's... Uh, something that we have to work in cooperation with other associations no? because this is a common a common problem uh, expectations in uh, 2024 uh, we are working in uh, how to increase the number of members of our association uh, it's important no, because it's the only way to get or to to work in projects. Okay, at the moment in my association we are about 42, 43 people. We will get some more, maybe four or five. Uh, but that's a plan. No, to work how to increase the members of my association. Uh, the other thing is uh, we work in social programs. Yes, uh, you know, we, we are living now um, a, a crisis with uh, climate in Peru, like in the rest of the world. Maybe you hear about the El Nino phenomenon. So we are now in transition of this phenomenon, and we will we are now watching some of the consequences of this. So it's a lot of rural areas that they will need some uh, help. And uh, talking with the members of the association, we are working in projects to help these people in the future. No? Um, and uh, work again, as I told you, in these uh, laws to get uh, benefits as a workers in, in my country. As GIPA, uh, my association or our association, is, uh, it was founded in 1999, 1999. So these uh, 24 we are celebrating uh, 25 years of the foundation. So we are working you know, in the programs we will, uh, we will have to celebrate these 25 years of uh, foundation. Being amigos, uh, this is uh, what we have, right? And I hope 
it was clear. And if you have any question, I will be so happy to answer. Thank Ayala. you very much, Gerardo. Thank you so much. And um, a really balanced presentation of your challenges, achievements, and also expectations. And we wish you all the best in our continued endeavor for all of us to highlight that tourist guides are a profession and, um, as you say, also deserve professional benefits. So thank you very, very much. Gracias. Gracias. And enjoy the rest of the day. So good morning once more to Akifa. But without further much ado, uh, dear colleagues and uh, watchers and listeners, let's go to Switzerland. Our next speaker is Benno, Benno Stubb of the Swiss Tourist Guide Swiss Association. Guide. And let's listen to um, our colleagues' projects, challenges, and achievements there. Over to you, Benno. Thank you very much. Yes, hello to everyone. I am Benno from the Swiss Tourist Guide Association called the ASGT. That's the French abbreviation for Association Suisse de Guide Touristique. Yes, I'm glad to present you shortly the ASGT, which is a member of the Swiss Tourism Association, the STA, which is on their behalf, the umbrella organization of Swiss tourism. Swiss tourism has quite a nice part of the turnover in the Swiss industry. We have about 17 billion Swiss francs as a turnover last year. So in tourism, there are a lot of people engaged and a lot of people earn their living through uh, foreign tourists coming to Switzerland on one hand, but also local tourism in Switzerland, which is also a big influence. I myself, an outdoor guide and tour leader. Uh, I'm also member of the board from the ASGT. As, as a guide, my personal focus lies in educational tourism more than uh, others. Uh, some of it is recre recreational in different environments. And um, that's a bit my impact, my background. In Switzerland, there are a lot of different guides working. We have the tour guides, tourist guides, uh, city guides. We have mountain guides, trekking guides, a lot of leisure guides. Their guiding is a big thing. But Switzerland is quite particular in its legislation about guiding. There is no such thing as an implemented law for guides. So actually anybody can be a guide and therefore there is no official training or there is no official diploma to become a guide in Switzerland. That applies only for tourist guides. Uh, ski instructors or mountain guides, sure they have a very severe and serious training to undergo. But our association, the ASGT, is sees itself as a non-profit association for those guides working in Swiss tourism, such as city guides or tour guides, museum guides, nature guides, and also people working in educational tourism. Even though the association is open to all persons who actively part practice their profession. Its central concern is to achieve the appreciation and recognition as tourist guides by the governmental secretary of education, research and innovation. So we are sitting at the table with all the other branches like uh, hotels, transports, tour operators, agencies, which of course depend as well on our services. The association itself provides services to its members. It accompanies and supports them in their professional and social advancement, also promotes their reputation and recognition in their profession. Our association uh, strives to ensure a high level of quality in the care of its guests, 
However, the ASGT is open to partnerships with other organizations interested in Swiss tourism and the exchange of experience, of course. A membership in the ASGT is open to all persons who are actively involved, like I said, in Swiss tourism and representative hosting. Uh, one particular uh, one particular thing about the ASGT is our communication uh, because Switzerland is a multilingual country. Our association uh, speaks French, German and Italian to its members and uh, on events and uh, further education uh, meetings we do need to often simultaneously translate so everybody can understand. Even English would be the most common language. We do not communicate to each other in English. We try to fig figure out how we can do manage this in German or French, or sometimes in, in uh, Italian. Uh, of course, because we have customers from all over the places, our guides are all coming from a different background. Many of them are Swiss, but many of them have a foreign background and they can be guides in their particular language from Eastern countries to Asian countries to Spanish and, Port and all these Latin languages, which are rather common. Um, to our members, we offer like the, the ones who are active members of our associations. And I must say there are not so many because it's not a need, it's, it's compulsory. Uh, we offer a virtual platform like a website um, where either customers or guides can search and contact qualified tourist guides among our active member pool or guides who can advertise their profiles and their services to everybody. The platform is available on their www.swisstourguide.com and it is one of many different uh, websites where you can find guides to uh, match your needs and wishes. But it offers a simple and practical handling for the selection of suitable guest hosts. Criteria might be, for example, the, the area or the region or the city where you want to find a guide. Also by language or by activity, there are different points. You can find somebody who is matching your what you're looking for. Um, one of our focus and uh, what we really are uh, stressing on is like a continuous education and quality promotion in guiding. Um, an active continuous education and smart training in guiding skills are a matter of honor for an AS, ASGT member. And um, every serious professional tourist guide should really always reconsider to look for further education. It just optimizes the quality standard in guest care and increases professional and social competence nationwide, international. That's uh, what we really want to do. What is really important for us in Switzerland at the moment, it's a big uh, issue as well. It's like the inclusion of people with special physical or psychological needs, e.g. barrier free traveling. Um, that's quite on the menu too. So we are really, it's also a market, like a lot of people would like to travel, but they cannot. So we would like to make it happen and possible for everybody. And um, visiting and experiencing a country should be made possible for everybody. Uh, that's, I think we're all quite uh, agreeing on that. So, uh, for us, on upcoming projects is like certainly enhancing our website, but I guess that is like everybody's uh, issue all the time. You have to update and it's always a, 
a site on the construction. And uh, another one is like we are focusing on the continuing training and education. And uh, for this, we have different issues. We have different themes. Uh, they can go in history. They can go in culture. But we are, and you can make a pick. If you're a guide and you would like to know more about something, then you can pick one of our education modules. What is very, we have are about, in our association, are about 124 active members, which is compared to the number of guides in this country, not that big. But we are actually the only really official one. So sometimes we have old guides, they drop out, we have new guides coming in. So the number of our members is varying from year to year. And uh, as I said before, we don't have a governmental law for tourist guides. So tourist guides are normally working after the standards of their employers or the branch they're working for. Unfortunately, there is often a quality difference in incentives, incentive or mass tourism guiding. Well, both got their right of existence and it's the guests who decide what kind of service they would like to buy. And for the guides, it's by their own performance and success in guiding. They will justify their employment. So the conclusion is um, the ASGT is offering support to keep its members up to date, to follow new tendencies, and just to build up a network all over the country. And um, the aim of our efforts is to represent tourist guides in tourist industry here and abroad, being aware of and part of the cultural and uh, actual changes, especially in sustainability and recreation and in quality of improvement. So to make a long speak short, goodbye from me with a big thank to you all in behalf of the ASGT for your intention and your openness to participate in an exchange of experience across borders. I wish to everybody a very good season and grand turismo. Bye. Thank you very much, Benno. Thank you so much. You touched on a lot of really important issues, tourism for all, openness, um, education as well, standards. A lot of tourist guides, as you will know, uh, especially in Northern Europe and in other parts of the world, our profession is um, unregulated. So exactly as Benno said, the way we distinguish ourselves from other guides is through standards, through training and through education. And this brings me actually on uh, to our next two speakers who will be joining me on screen shortly. Uh, we will have one more Tourist Guide Association speaking to us um, at the end of our session. So we're slowly coming to the end of our session. But first of all, I would like to invite Maria and Helga to join me on stage. And they are two of our national trainers, two of our WFDJ trainers. I know this is about the journey of tourist guides associations um, over the last year. So we thought a little interlude and look at the journey of uh, two of our trainers. So both Helga and Maria uh, attended a course, the train the trainer course in our international training center in Cyprus last November. And let's hear what they have been up to, so to speak, since their qualification. Who starts? <laughs> Please start. So I start. First, I wanted to thank you, uh, and especially the training committee, for a, now a gift, or is it maybe something I should say, um, it's not such a good thing. Because now when I look other uh, colleagues guiding, I always observe what they do, and especially what they do not do right. Stand, uh, position, stand, and positioning, and you should this, and you should that. I had such a great experience uh, during the two weeks in Cyprus, and it made me very, very conscious about uh, what is a good 
and uh, bad habit in our tourist guide life. And immediately coming back from uh, Cyprus, I had the opportunity to do an internship at the University of uh, Paris 10. It is a, a big you know, university, over 50,000 uh, students, and uh, they have a special uh, course for uh, tourist guides. And uh, there I did my internship. And in uh, last uh, July, I was admitted as a teacher at the university. And I already gave uh, 24 hours of uh, teaching in the, at the university. I have a teacher's background. I'm a German teacher. And teaching to groups was something I abandoned because too stressy and uh, I didn't feel well. And uh, something that I learned in Cyprus and I cannot thank enough uh, the, this uh, door that opened again. I'm really enjoying again teaching. I'm, I'm having so... it's it's. I have to thank the students in my class for giving me so much pleasure uh, back. It is, it is always uh, a present I, I get when I'm uh, saying goodbye, see you next time. You know, is uh, those smiles, uh, the questions and um, ideas that comes from a group of uh, future tourist guides that you prepare for their future profession. And uh, uh, last but not least, I would like to thank also the opportunity that gave me these two weeks and after the uh, meetings, virtual meetings I had with uh, my, my fellow colleagues of that time that now are friends, like it is Maria that will uh, talk to you in a couple of seconds. Thank you very much, Helga. It sounds you hit the ground running, so to speak. Well done. And I'm glad to hear you are enjoying the training as you enjoy the guiding. So passion, I think, as uh, one of our previous speakers says, Gerardo, it was, it's very, very important. So Maria, would, like, would you like to share your journey over the last year? Uh, yes, uh, of course. <laughs> I have designed the presentation, so um, just give me one uh, second. Um, okay, uh, so greetings uh, to everybody. Uh, for me, uh, it's uh, a pleasure to be here. Uh, and uh, I'm Maria Rastvorova. Uh, I'm a tourist guide uh, from uh, Kyiv, Ukraine. Uh, currently, I'm uh, living in Austria. Uh, and uh, last year, in uh, uh, November 2022, uh, I have got uh, this uh, chance, uh, and actually I have taken it, uh, to uh, go through uh, the uh, course, uh, for, um, and I have be become uh, the uh, national um, trainer for the tourist guides uh, in Ukraine, uh, and um, uh, currently, uh, I uh, uh, collaborate uh, with uh, the Ukrainian uh, Tourist uh, Guide Associations uh, and uh, I present uh, them uh, on uh, this uh, uh, Zoom uh, today. So, uh, like, as you all know, right now there is uh, still war, which is uh, continue, which is unfortunately been uh, continue, been continuing in Ukraine. So, uh, uh, we still uh, have uh, the Russian military invasion and uh, the second um, war uh, winter is uh, ahead. And um, uh, this is uh, the main challenge uh, which affects uh, on uh, Ukrainian tourism and uh, which uh, affects uh, on uh, the tourist uh, guiding in Ukraine because uh, due to the war and uh, due to uh, these security reasons, um, Ukrainian cities and Kyiv's, uh, Kyiv city as well has a much less amount of tourists uh, that it uh, has been uh, before the war or and or even after COVID. And actually, uh, this is uh, the biggest challenge uh, for the Ukrainian tourism and for the Ukrainian tourist guiding in general. 
And uh, in the same time, I would like to mention that today we are having the 6th of December. And uh, today in Ukraine, uh, was, uh, we celebrate St. Nicholas Day. Uh, and uh, as well, uh, we celebrate uh, the day of uh, the Ukrainian army, uh, which uh, currently uh, defends uh, Ukrainian uh, borders and European border. And actually, uh, thanks to the Ukrainian army, uh, we have uh, this uh, opportunity to develop tourism and uh, to continue our job on a uh, tourism development. And further, I would like to mention several activities, uh, which are the most significant one, uh, ones uh, on uh, my way as the national trainer and uh, on uh, my way as a tourism professional. And I would like to say that um, uh, the course um, uh, of the, tra uh, the training in Cyprus really have inspired me a lot for these activities and uh, has uh, strongly uh, impacted uh, on my further professional development. So uh, the, fresh, uh, the most fresh piece of news uh, that actually uh, on uh, December 1st, uh, I have conducted uh, my first uh, training uh, for uh, the Ukrainian Association of uh, the Tourist Guides. And uh, here on uh, this slide, you can see a screenshot uh, from this online training. So the training uh, has uh, been um, dedicated uh, to the methodology of uh, the tourist guiding for uh, the people with uh, disabilities and uh, due to the effects of the war um, in our tourist guiding we should uh, really consider how to work uh, with uh, these uh, guests and uh, actually I really enjoyed uh, this training as well as uh, the participants and I hope uh, this is uh, my uh, start of uh, training activity for the Ukrainian tourist uh, guides, uh, both uh, in, online and as well, hopefully, uh, on site. Uh, as well, uh, during uh, this year, uh, um, I have um, uh, visited uh, the uh, VTM London exhibition in the collaboration uh, with uh, my colleagues uh, from the Kyiv City State Administration. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, we have um, a very like strong uh, intention uh, to uh, redevelop and to recover tourism after the war. And uh, due to this, a lot of activities uh, as well for the tourist guides education are taking place uh, right now um, uh, in Ukraine and actually I would like to share uh, that uh, we have um, created with my four colleagues we have created a climate friendly travel initiative for Ukraine so in uh, the collaboration with um, Asanix Malta and now we are working as well with with the tourist guides for uh, the development of uh, the climate friendly travel uh, approach in Ukraine and uh, I would like to welcome you to join our Facebook page uh, because uh, we really uh, like this uh, international engagement and as a previous speaker has already mentioned right now climate um, change is uh, on uh, this global agenda so to conclude uh, i would like uh, to uh, say uh, that uh, we have uh, this uh, challenge uh, of the war in Ukraine, uh, this uh, Russian military invasion, and uh, as I have mentioned, it is the, the strongest uh, challenge for the Ukrainian tourism and uh, the Ukrainian tourism guiding. Uh, uh, in the same time, uh, tourism and tourist guiding has place in Ukraine. And uh, we uh, are really eager uh, to restart tourism. And uh, that's because Ukrainian tourist guides um, uh, uh, take their time for preparation uh, them in the best manner. And uh, that's because I would like um, again uh, to say my um, gratitude and appreciation uh, to this course of the World Federation of the Tourist Guides because um, uh, this knowledge uh, really uh, helps me and creates uh, the opportunity to teach Ukrainian tourist guides according to the world standards, which is uh, crucially important. Uh, and um, hopefully to see you on the next courses and on the next VFTJ event. So um, my big uh, greeting to everybody who is here and who will watch this webinar.
Thank you so much, Maria. And thank you also for preparing a workshop for our upcoming convention in uh, Sicily in January 2024. So you will hear more from Maria there. Yeah, so um, if you are interested to hear more about the training division of WFDJ, please come back tomorrow. Tomorrow I will also be giving a brief overview of the role and the purpose of actually having trainers in our organization. But back now to you, dear colleagues of the Tourist Guide Associations. We have one last um, colleague ready standing backstage, and that's Glenn Jones of the Professional uh, Association of Tourist Guides of London. So, Glenn, would you like to come and take the stage for our last presentation today? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my, as, as was mentioned, my name is Glenn Jones. I am a, a member of the Association of Professional Tourist Guides, a London-based um, a London-based uh, association that represents tourist guides who are specifically blue badge guides based in London. Um, Many of us are members of the Guild of British Tourist Guides it, that organises training. There's the institutes that liaises with government, and there are other associations in the uh, in Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Uh, two sacks. Uh, let's have a look at what we were planning on doing. Maybe we'll have that. We'll have... There we go. The Association of Professional Tourist Guides, unfortunately, um, it's rather an old JPEG, so I wasn't, uh, um, but it uh, gives you the idea. It's affiliated to a trade union, um, whilst competition and marketing prevents us from setting fees officially, we do uh, negotiate amongst ourselves a trade rate, and an advertised trade rate, and that forms a basis on which we, uh, we charge clients, whether they be trade members or uh, or, or private members, depending on where our businesses come from. Um, I'm looking at challenges and opportunities that have taken place over the last uh, last two years, effectively. Um, uh, visitors, pr principally 22, 23, as you know, I was reminded at the beginning of this um, uh, this meeting how we're um, uh, with the difficulties with Zoom and technology as to how far we have come, and that we're all out of practice because we've been dealing with people. Um, the term unprecedented demand was frequently mentioned. I could, there are certain days this year I would have, could have worked three times in different, different people doing different things. What's become, what became the, there was a, a almost a, the fear of over tourism where, um, uh, where numbers and, and the sites and we're still sites that we visit were, were suffering from, um, uh, post-COVID staff shortages or lack of funding, so we're not open on specific days, which meant that uh, that, that, certainly, that means there's a greater volume condensed into a, a shorter period. Um, you may be aware that there were some significant royal events took place. Um, you know, this is a, uh, uh, a sovereign nation. We have a monarch at the head of it, uh, a queen in 2022 and a king in 2023. Um, I'll mention briefly those uh, events as we go on. We've suffered some industrial action, again, post-COVID. Um, people have worked through COVID and then turned around and oh, said, it's enough, is enough. And our visitor demographic, I'll discuss the issues. And I'm a driver guide myself, as well as a, a step-on guide, as well as walking guide, as well as giving the Christmas lights tour next week. Um, traffic restrictions, and then there was the debate about sustainability and um and em emission controls uh, to discuss. This is, um, I'm calling from London. Um, we are talking about, you know, we are in England. We cannot pass without discussing the weather here. That's what we do. And then we'll just run over the challenges and opportunities that we're going to talk. So visitors of 2022, according to our Visit Britain, um, the uh, tra uh, sort of trade nation for tourists, um, we were down 24% on 2019. That's but still 31 million people took the risk and arrived. Many people contracted COVID in the process um, that 2022 years, or not in the process of coming, but as a result of the changes and so the, uh, the, the lack of predictability around travel arrangements and being dis uh, the disruption of travel arrangements. I remember starting a tour with six people and ending up with two the, uh, uh, by day three. Um, 
Um, the spend was therefore down on 17% on 2019, so we're down, but still 26 billion into the, uh, the national economy. So we can only forecast what 2023 was like. Um, and I can give you the official figures that saying that there are, with getting back towards 2019, they say not. They say down by 37.5. Well, they, they say they were, were down by 92% on you know, 8% less than in 2019. I beg to differ. The queue, the little picture in the, uh, in the corner here is in Windsor High Street. This queue is tailing back around a church, down a hill, around a corner, up to the entrance of, um, of Windsor Castle. And that will take about an hour and a half to two hours just to get through to the security part of Windsor Castle. Um, uh, the, uh, the, but the spend was interesting of £30 billion, so 109% increase on 2019. Um, and that is without some high spending uh, visitors that uh, that haven't uh, hadn't or had all returned belatedly. I'm going to talk specifically about issues around the uh, the three I've mentioned. We're a sovereign nation. We've got Westminster uh, Westminster Abbey on the top right, uh, the Tower of London, and Windsor Castle, all of which featured significantly in um, uh, in I believe I, I think I'm arrogantly assuming world attention, but certainly was a big feature here. Uh, Windsor Castle um, is now post-COVID only opens five days a week and they are odd days. They open, um, they cl they're closed on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. They're open Thursday to Monday. It means that we've got that five days and the Brits go away Friday, Friday Saturday and Sunday. And the Brits come and see the royal family. So the weekends are incredibly busy. The church here on the left-hand side is St. George's Chapel. That is doesn't open for uh, that is only open for church services an active church it's where queen elizabeth her majesty the queen elizabeth the second is buried uh, it's obviously created a significant amount of interest um since she died in september uh, 2022 um because 2022 of course we had her platinum jubilee um so there were huge royal attention um uh, during that year and ridiculous and around our wanderings of London, you know, trying to uh, condense visits to Buckingham Palace or visits around Buckingham Palace or just the, uh, or going into Westminster Abbey at the time, we just were part of our difficult first world, I accept. Um, Tower of London is um, still open seven days a week. The crown jewels are a significant factor. They were taken away for a week, uh, disappeared for the months, bits of them disappeared for the months prior to the coronation. Um, the visitor numbers were, uh, for, once they've been returned, were significantly increased in 2023. We produce amongst ourselves and our Facebook chats, you know, what's the report on the queue to, queue to the dual house? And again, um, uh, one of the issues here, my fellow guides were, um, uh, we're banned from visiting the um, uh, the Crown Jewels, that we can take people into the um, uh, into the Tower of London, we can take them around certain parts, but we're restricted from actually going into where the, the crown jewels are, lest we speak to people and explain and hold up the queues and whatnot. So we have what it was we've begrudgingly cast out as pariahs from the um, uh, uh, from the crown jewels. However, it meant that you have these regular little meetings with people that uh, you either trained with or meet in the depths of winter on training courses. So you have. Um, so beneath the little monkeys, you have um, some others. Uh, Westminster Abbey was busy. It saw the funeral of Queen Elizabeth in, in 2022, and it saw the coronation of, of King Charles III. Surprisingly restricting the amount of closures for the um, uh, for the proceedings. Uh, it was about two weeks closed in the summer, so we were straight in there with people, with visitors during. Um, um, uh, once normality, but of course everyone is interested in knowing or seeing where the coronation took. Well, I say everyone. Visitors to London are, are very interested in seeing where the coronation took place. Industrial action, rail strikes uh, affects. Um, uh, we have an ongoing rail strike. It's been going on for about a year. It feels like um, I know. Um, and but with our industrial legislation, there um, uh, the the unions can only um, they need to vote to strike, 
um, that needs to have a significant number of its membership. And then they have been the, the rails in the rail companies in this country are separated into different companies so we're not one you get on a train you can go from one end of the country to another but you may be traveling uh through the uh, the realms of different um uh different companies all of which or many of which have different unions and different aspects of the drivers um, so we have a confusing strike it's not an all out the rails have stopped working solidly for months it's just that one union will go on strike one day well that would disrupt things because you've got no drivers uh the ticket collectors will go on on another day that's another day's disruption or you may just find the train was cancelled between six o'clock uh one day or the strike is called at six o'clock one day goes back to work at six o'clock the following day but the trains are in the wrong place at the wrong time it meant i had people traveling yeah, we, we, sustainable travel is what we're being encouraged to promote. Um, people traveling from city to city, best way in this country to travel by train. I know people were having to catch taxis at short notice uh, because of the, well, because there were no trains or they just canceled their, um, uh, canceled their plans altogether because it just wasn't possible. Uh, the effects on guides um, was getting, principally getting to work. Um, I need to try if, to get into London. I, if I'm not driving or walk, if I'm not driver guiding in London, I need to travel by public transport. The uh, uh, parking is prohibitive in, in London for just a um, just a visit uh, for an eight hour visit. So if I were with an eight hour tour, so we were prevented. It was very difficult. There were a couple of days where uh, where we were found where. Um, it was time to move on anyway um so our demographic are um, uh, the predominant number of um, uh, visitors to the uk came from the states uh, the notable absences were from china and russia um the russians have not returned uh, chinese people began traveling back at the later month uh, the last few months in summer and visitors from that part of the world bring their own challenges as we say i think we've we've glossed glossed over them in, um, in previous speakers but we'll uh, talk about that later traffic issues um emissions older cars uh suffering from restrictions uh speed restrictions are uh, post covid uh we can own, uh, now only travel at 20 miles an hour at certain meters so that's 30 kilometers an hour and but the density of, uh, of traffic partly due to tra uh, the transport chaos uh, has meant that uh, has produced its own tra uh, challenges. Uh, part of the controls that were any new vehicle must be electric. There's a whole debate about how far you can go in an electric car. Um, there we go. The weather that that happened. It was a wet winter. We didn't snow. I don't think it, in the south it didn't snow. Uh, my Scottish friends will um, will will know it was grim, uh, uh, fairly uh, fairly bleak winter than their, their part. The south. The southeast uh, and London in particular, the southeast gets the, uh, the buffer from Europe, so it gets protected. And the North Atlantic, uh, the, the southwest, and Wales take all the rain from coming from those who are relatively dry. But we, it felt as if there was no spring. It was suddenly cold, and then summer the lights were switched on, and the flowers came into bloom, and it was amazing. Um, however, and then the schools broke up in July, and it tipped down with rain. So hospitality really suffered. Challenges or opportunities post pandemic, um, better planning is required. We can't, we don't have the spontaneity anymore. Um, the reduction in specifically, um, uh, you know, if I go to Windsor Castle, my ticket is for two o'clock. If I turn up at one o'clock, I've got to wait, uh, wait till two o'clock. Similarly, I go to places like the, the Roman Baths in Bath uh, at Stonehenge. Uh, so the, the, we're now focusing on a more rigid itinerary, which is not, is it, uh, not quite hasn't been my style in the past. So you lack spontaneity. You know, you, you, you're trying to appear to give someone a um, a unique opportunity, but you're never unique because you're giving them exactly the same thing as the last people had. Um, but with a, many places, I say, have been well. Many places have been closed during COVID have refurbished, and uh, say hotels. Restaurants are, uh, are fabulous at the moment because they've all taken many of them took grants to uh, to improve their facilities and so accommodation here is is um, quite uh, um, 
quite well disposed. Uh, local interest. It meant that we've got, um, I, I'm, for the first time in a few years, I'm taking English people out. Um, uh, local interest, people wanting to do things locally. It, that's meant that, that they, they coalesce with the, uh, the, the foreign uh, visitors. Um, so we end up with huge numbers of, of travellers in certainly the West End of London. It's a very densely populated nowadays. Um, and it's reduced certainly guide, driver guides. Many of them, their cars were left lying around for two years and they decided to uh, not worth the hassle. The, the legislation around, uh, it was glossed over by my Irish friend at the beginning of the uh, uh, this afternoon, uh, saying how difficult he is with the legislation. We have a similar, uh, under control certainly in London, uh, thanks to an online platform that came about, an online taxi platform that I believe is um, in many countries around the world, um, certainly to try and combat that. They've uh, in introduced significant fees and significant controls over who can can uh, can can't drive. Our season now seems to extend beyond the summer. Um, national football, American football came over. It brings Americans into um, um, uh, into uh, into uh, into London uh, in October. Uh, Upper Spill was you know, in November went a little quiet, and now we've started. They have uh, uh, the Christmas celebration in December. Um, so, and the signs are that whilst last year were postponed trips, um, the world gets see you know suddenly gets smaller, and everyone heads to London. Um, so we are going to have we had two years worth of visitors who had been postponing their trips last year. We will have the new visitors next year who have seen our royal family advertise uh, the country um, this year. So well, it's exciting, exciting times here. Thank you very much for your time. Um, thank you for being, thank you all for being part of what one of our journalists described as being the industry of human happiness. What a fantastic way to end, Glenn. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. So, and thank you everybody who uh, joined our journey backstage today, shared opportunities, challenges, and um, expectations for the, for the future. And thank you everyone who was watching. Before we play our video, as promised for our second host country or bit country, I should say, sorry, bit country for the 2026 WFDJ convention, uh, just a preview for tomorrow. So tomorrow, my colleague James will be sharing the uh, association journeys. And tomorrow we are going to Scotland, to Japan, to the Philippines, to South Africa, to Sweden, and to the Fiji Island. So please be back for tomorrow. And thanks again for watching today. Okay, I hope you liked the video that was shown a while ago. 
a, a, a short clips of our community tour guides in the Philippines. And uh, people are questioning or asking why uh, we would like the bid for the upcoming uh, WFTGA uh, 21st convention of WFTGA on 2026, <clears throat> and, and uh, particularly in the Philippines, because um, we would like to share, I mean, for how many decades uh, we had the chance to to visit and conduct our convention to cold uh, uh, places. I think it's now time for you to explore and uh, have the warm weather of the Philippines and experience the Filipino tour guides uh, hospitality and at the same time people uh, others doesn't know that the Filipino community guides uh, can speak English as well and uh, part of our uh, theme for the WFTGA on 2026 is we really want to focus on the community guides uh, the community guides uh, local uh, opportunities. What do we mean by global opportunities? We would like to share the global and the local opportunities. And in case that Philippines will be uh, chosen to be part of it, uh, it, it will be a great opportunity uh, for, for our community guides. And uh, we really wanted to share as well uh, the Filipino Community Tours Guides, a brand of service excellence, which uh, we, uh, it has a seven uh, core values. One, we call it the makamalika, or the what we call the belief and respect to the divine providence. That's how uh, the, the Filipino Community Tourist Guides are. The what we call makatao, the hospitality, as I mentioned, we are family, our community guides are really family oriented and has the interpersonal relationship and belongingness. The makakalikasan or the Filipino stewards on the environment. The makabansa, uh, our Filipino community tourist guides are really uh, stewards uh, or nation builders. And we are, our community guides are uh, we have the power of smile and the spirit of the Filipino and, of course, the Filipino resiliency. I hope, uh, surely, you will love the community of tourist guides in the Philippines.